Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that it is a gorgeous day where you are. It is absolutely beautiful here in North Carolina, where I am joining you from. My name is Megan Boren, and I am a project manager at SREB and lead our work in the teacher workforce. Um, and today is our second in a conversation about educators as the overlooked workforce. Um, our first conversation on this topic about teacher workforce and teacher shortages was several weeks ago where we examined um, some data and tried to look at um, the uh, landscape of the teacher workforce in our region. And today we'll be having part two of that conversation where we go into um, looking through some solution ideas, some promising practices, some best practices um, on that topic. and. Um, discuss those issues with three wonderful panelists that we have joining us today. Um, before I make introductions of our panelists, I will just um, share that one thing we want to emphasize with um, all of our folks that we work with and um, our partners in this effort is that our teacher shortages and our teacher workforce in and of itself um, is really important, not only to education, obviously, making sure that we make gains with our students and we provide um, the best possible educational opportunities for children of all ages, but it is actually an economic issue. Teachers are the ones who are, of course, responsible for making sure that the preparation begins with our students who will enter the workforce one day and um, help to ensure that we have a thriving economy. So teacher shortages and the teacher workforce are integral to economic and workforce development issues as well. And this is something that we keep in mind throughout all of these conversations um, and our work together. As I mentioned, our last webinar, we, we focused in on um, trying to look at the data around teacher shortages and asking our, the question, do we have a shortage problem? And if so, what does it look like? Where is it? Um, and during that webinar, we really discussed um, several key things. That shortages are not just about numbers. Um, shortages are not just about bodies. Yes, that is important. Do we have folks to lead all of our classrooms? But another um, really important aspect to this, several really important aspects to this are, do we have quality teachers to lead all of our classrooms? And how can we make sure that we um, have a, a quality pipeline coming forth to fill um, those who are, are leaving the profession? How do we make sure that we are increasing the diversity of the teaching profession? And also, of course, when we're looking at these three pieces, what is the distribution of our talent, of our, of our great teachers, of our, the diversity of our teachers, and making sure that students have equitable access to great, um, great educators. Um, if you want to check out this data that we did preview um, during that webinar several weeks ago and um, uh, see some of our um, slides on that and some data charts and other things that we've made available, you can visit our website at teacher.srb.org slash resources slash teacher dash workforce dash data. All right, at this time, I want to um, get our three fabulous panelists who uh, have joined us today for this conversation um, and I'll let them introduce themselves um, rather than uh, doing, doing that myself. But um, I'll start with the Honorable Paul Pinsky who's a state senator from the great state of Maryland. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, uh, I have been in education for 40 years in my other life. We're a part-time legislature. Uh, I also chair the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee and was one of the architects on the uh, Blueprint for Maryland's Future, which was a major school reform effort. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and next, I have Dr. Carrie Wright, a former state superintendent of Mississippi, and moving on to, I'm sure, um, still great things, um, <laughs> Dr. Wright. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having me. Yes, I was uh, privileged to be the state superintendent in Mississippi for almost nine years, and during that time, uh, led a lot of really great reform work, and one of the things that we um, just 
finished up right before I left was the governor's task force on education, human capital. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, during our time here. But yes, I have moved back to Maryland, uh, where I kind of consider um, home. That's where my family is and anxious to be a part of this. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Very good to see you both again. Um, and we do have a third panelist, Dr. Brian Hassel, who's co-president of Public Impact. Um, he is uh, currently jumping in as quickly as he can. So we'll come back and have him introduce himself in just a few moments when he is um, when he's fully connected and technology is our friend again. <laughs> um, as as you know, it tends not to be sometimes. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go forward with a few more introductory comments while we um, get get Dr. Hassel connected, and um, here's some great discussion from our three panelists today. But the point of this conversation is to dive in a bit deeper on how do we actually make gains with our teacher shortage issue and with making sure that our teaching profession is attractive and one where more and more folks want to join it. Um, and serve our students, serve our communities, and help our economy. So how do we recruit, develop, and retain enough strong, diverse educators, especially in the places where we need it the most? Um, because as we did see in, in our previous webinar, there are certainly pockets where our shortage issues are a bit greater than others. And we need to be sure that we are serving all of our students in our states and our communities as best that we can. So SRV has been working on this um, uh, conversation and um, policy work and practice work on this for several years now. And we've issued a, a renovation blueprint report um, where we try and pinpoint some really great things that are going around, um, going on around our region and in the South. And of course, we'll have um, our panelists speak directly to some of those things. Um, but this blueprint report is an opportunity, hopefully, for um, uh, more and more states, districts, and communities to have these conversations about how do we really actually make comprehensive, um, you know, full um, change plans in order to make teaching more attractive and um, reinforce the pipeline of our teacher workforces. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. So. In this renovation blueprint, we highlight that in order to make comprehensive change in any state, in any district, you really have to make sure that you are looking at four key things all together and making a comprehensive plan, uh, solution plan, and action plan that encompasses all four of these really key aspects. That includes um, the entire teacher career continuum from the point where you're trying to recruit those folks all the way through to retirement. So it's really important to make sure that you have an interlocking system of policy and practice that touches on pathways and preparation into um, the teacher workforce, that we make sure that we have really key professional supports from before they enter the profession all, all the way through um, to their most, their most advanced role and, and final year of teaching making sure that we have licensure systems and those state policies that really enforce um, those, you know, reinforce those supports, reinforce um, multiple pathways into the profession and, and quality preparation for every single candidate, as well as rigorous standards um, for all of our teachers. And then lastly, making sure that we also have compensation packages um, that are tied to each of these pieces that reinforce um, career ladders and new licensure structures that help um, uh, reinforce professional supports and make sure that any teacher or future teacher, aspiring teacher, can see their own pathway through the career. I'll pause here for a second because technology has finally worked out in our favor and Dr. Hassel has joined us. Uh, we just did introductions just a moment ago, Dr. Hassel, and I did say that you, you were on your way, but we'll pause for a second second, and if you could please introduce yourself for the audience. Hi, sorry to be late. Technical difficulties, but glad to be here. And I'm the co-president of Public Impact and leader of one of the co-leader of the Opportunity Culture Initiative that's working to put this kind of work into effect in districts and schools around the country. 
in states. Glad to be here. We are glad to have you very much. Um, I'll just finish with a couple more comments and then we'll turn to some questions um, that I have for the panelists and have them share some really fantastic ideas um, with you all. So um, a little bit more detail, of course, is provided in our blueprint report around these four key pieces. Uh, Pathways and Preparation supports licensure and compensation, as I just mentioned. Um, and there are some, some key elements within each of these things that, um, you know, some key principles, if you will, that we emphasize in the report to make sure um, that as states, state leaders, uh, community leaders, school leaders, are thinking about these uh, different aspects and these different pieces, that they're really um, coming at each one in a comprehensive way and then making a plan that does interlock and connect um, quite deeply on each of these pieces. And here's just a visual in talking about um, the career ladder that I mentioned. And this is something that more and more uh, states and districts are of course looking, looking to um, and moving toward we'll hear a little bit about some of these um, today, but making sure that teachers can see multiple paths, even though this looks like one path, that there are multiple paths for folks to come in to the profession to be supported and to grow um, in their own instructional capabilities, to grow in their own um, ways and remain in the classroom if they so choose, rather than having to jump to administrative roles. And making sure that each of our puzzle pieces, if you will, are following along on, on that path, multiple paths with our teachers. So I want to um, turn to our panelists and have them discuss some of these aspects with you all and a little, you know, dive in a little bit more deeply on what's going on in several states around um, the region. So we're going to focus our um, discussion. And before, before we do dive in. I want to encourage all of our attendees, if you have a question for any of our panelists, to please put that in the question box. We'll be monitoring that and asking uh, as many questions of our panelists as possible today. Um, but let's get started with uh, Dr. Hassel, if that's okay with you. I um, wanted to ask you, um, since you are a leader in research and your organization is um, also, you know, a leader in innovative change and solution solution planning for excellent teaching. Um, and you've worked with, you know, multiple districts and states around the country. Um, please tell us, if you will, about some of the challenges that you all see for educators um, and what you've learned about finding, supporting, and retaining great teachers. And if you could also, you know, lay out for us um, is addressing these four key elements that we've uh, mentioned in our blueprint report. Um, addressing those together, is that possible? And why can't states um, solve the shortage issue by just addressing one singular element alone? Yes, Megan, I mean, even with COVID, of course, the challenge is amped up significantly, but even before COVID, we heard huge challenges from educators whenever we talk to them in the field. And they're all familiar to the audience probably. So the, there's increasing demand put on educators to meet the needs of all students as, as they should and reach high standards with every child. And yet that's not matched with the, uh, commensurate support. Teachers work largely alone. They're, they're, they're not supported and guided towards that vision effectively, especially when they're new teachers. And their compensation has been flat in real terms, especially when you account for the fact that their hours have gone up over the last 50 years. Uh, 50 years ago, about half the money in education went to teacher salaries. Now it's about a third of the money. A lot of other things have gotten increases. Teacher pay has been largely flat. And they also look around and see their peers in other fields have career advancement opportunities where they can advance, earn more, and continue to practice their craft. They don't have to leave their desired profession to, to be a, uh, a senior associate in a law firm or to move up the ranks as a doctor or a nurse or other professions. And so teachers are really in a, a tough spot. Uh, we hear that over and over again. And it really is this suite of things that are on the screen that can help address it. 
what I would say we're learning in our work with districts and schools is that the best way to address all these things at once is to really change the way the role of teacher looks in schools. And that means changing the way schools are organized. Right now, schools are largely one teacher, one classroom, where kids are assigned to each teacher in the elementary school or the several sections to each teacher in the middle school or high school. And those that teacher is really solely responsible for their learning. But what if we move to a team-based system where teachers work together on a team where a team leader, someone with prior high growth, a multi-classroom leader, as we call them, leads that team. And then they work together for, on behalf of all the students, getting guidance and support from each other and from that multi-classroom leader. Well, that can address all these four things at once. So it's a different uh, licensure policy slash career advancement path for teachers. They can move up in their career while continuing to teach, which is what they love. They can earn more over time. And in fact, all teachers can earn more as part of this kind of team-based package. Uh, there's much more professional support and mentorship, new teachers for sure, but also for teachers across their whole career. They can be part of a team and learn and, and grow over time. And then finally, these teams provide a great place for teacher residents to start their careers and learn on the job with a team, with a multi-classroom leader, and the funding can be reallocated to support them so they can actually earn while they are being a, a candidate to be a teacher. And therefore, uh, that diversifies the profession. So all of that's possible. But just to, to end, it really comes down to rethinking the way schools work. And then how can states support that with the kind of policies that you're talking about here, Megan? Great. Thank you, Dr. Hassel. Um, I'm going to go to Senator Pinsky next, but again, panelists, jump in and, and comment um, or, you know, ask each other questions if you wish in this conversation. Um, but Senator Pinsky, uh, Maryland, of course, has made some really big strides in this area and taken uh, some, some big significant action. Um, wanted to ask if you could please tell us in a nutshell what the Maryland Blueprint Law aims to do for teachers and how it addresses the four key elements that, that we've uh, been speaking about. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders was only one portion of a very major uh, reform effort in our state that we passed a couple of years ago. It was uh, five portions, five pillars. Uh, the other four were early childhood education, college and career readiness, uh, more resources for students to be successful, particularly those in concentrated poverty, special needs students and ESOL students. And the fifth pillar was uh, governance and accountability. But to be clear, it, it was a 10, it was meant to be a 10 to 11 year phase in. Uh, unfortunately, it was pushed back a year because of a, a good control veto. And then uh, in the interim, we were hit with COVID. So all of that has to be taken into context as well. You know, in terms of your four elements, Megan, that you uh, referred to a moment ago, let me collapse one and two together, teacher pathways and licensure. Uh, we did a number of things. We created teaching fellow scholarships, a full ride, a room, board, books, et cetera, uh, with the understanding that when you receive that as a high school senior going into college, uh, you'll commit to four years of teaching. Uh, we started, I think, with $2 million worth of scholarship and ramped that up to that $18 million of scholarships over the next four or five years with the idea of growing our own uh, with those students who've shown uh, an interest in teaching and had the GPA uh, to, uh, to gain access to the scholarship. We also call for developing explicit strategies for diversifying the teacher workforce. We, we want to ensure that the workforce reflects uh, the students and our, and our statewide uh, community as well. We also call for increasing the rigor of teacher prep programs across the state and licensure, as well as revising the teacher prep program. Uh, look, we took on a lot of things in, in this law. Uh, we also expanded the length of the practicum, uh, student teaching, if you will, from seven, eight weeks to nearly a year. Uh, we think teaching seven or eight weeks in February or March isn't the same as starting the school year, uh, getting rules in place, dealing with students as they enter, or teaching the day or two before uh, winter or Christmas break. Uh, so we expanded that uh, equivalent of a year. It doesn't have to be done all in one year. It can be done in portions. Uh, we also call for a portfolio-based assessment, uh, like an ed TPA or one of the others, for both graduation requirement and initial licensure. And that would be done by July 1, 2025. 
we think basing on performance-based rather than the paper pencil test is much more reflective of your understanding of teaching and the need to reflect on your teaching and make adjustments. Uh, we also put in place a strong reading assessment requirement to enter the profession. So a portfolio-based assessment for the um, uh, licensure as well as a reading assessment. We also add supports to help paras become fully certified teachers. We have to expand our horizon. Uh, obviously, we have to reach out to other people. There are a lot of highly qualified people uh, who are paraprofessionals we need to bring in. We also said that if you're an out-of-state teacher, you will need to pass a portfolio-based licensure uh, assessment within 18 months of arriving. Uh, we think that should be the standard. Uh, that is unless you have a national board certification, and that would be starting in 2026. And of course, we uh, call for a marketing campaign to attract teachers. Now to your um, third and fourth areas, teacher supports and working conditions, as well as compensation, we also made a number of, of uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we created uh, teacher collaborative grant programs between higher education and local school systems to strengthen pre-service and in-service. And many of our higher education and school systems have partnered up, sought those um, collaborative grants that are actually putting them in place. We set guidelines for teacher induction programs in all of our 24 jurisdictions. We have large jurisdictions, not two or three or 400. We have 24 across our state. They, they range from probably 10,000 students to 150,000 students. And here, here's the fundamental issue here. We establish statewide career ladders that must be, that can be expanded through local decisions. We set four levels, basic certification, uh, those pursuing a national board certification uh, or approved uh, masters, teachers achieving national board, and then we move into teachers on leadership track uh, to be mentors, experts, lead teachers. Uh, we also create a similar ladder for those that want to be school leaders or administrators. And as I mentioned, national board certification is a very strong foundation. And as we'll hear, that was a, a pretty strong uh, investment that Mississippi did when you hear from uh, Dr. Wright. Uh, we say that uh, if you achieve national board certification, you'll receive $10,000 annually. And if you teach in a high need school, you'll, teach, you'll receive an additional $7,000 for a $17,000 bump on top of your salary. And it includes expanded responsibilities, uh, mentorship, et cetera. We also increase planning time. Uh, clearly, teachers want to be treated like professionals. We also understand that's very um, expensive. So that's at the latter part of the 10 to 11 year phase in. We'd like to double the planning time for teachers, particularly those in the first three years. And finally, um, let me mention salary. Um, we call for a starting salary by July 2026 at $60,000. Uh, we think we have to be competitive with the private sector. And we also had a special 10% increase over the states that we benchmarked uh, to try to catch up with those leading states, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New Jersey. And that would be 10% uh, over three years uh, above and beyond the normally negotiated cost of living. So let, let me just conclude with this. Um, if, if we can raise the status of profession, uh, the more people... Um, are going to go into the profession and we can be more selective. And our benchmarking shows that in all successful school systems, the teaching profession was highly respected and not easy to enter. And finally, um, this might seem counterintuitive given there's a teacher shortage. And again, I want to remind you, we passed this before COVID, which I think has burned out many of our, our, our teachers. Um, but like with Teach for America, when you set a high standard and there's a great demand for it and you up the ante, you actually increase the number of people who pursue it. So these are a few of the uh, uh, items that we have in our blueprint for Maryland's future. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And uh, before we bump to Dr. Wright to um, hear another perspective on this, there's a couple quick questions that have come through for you to clarify some of the points that you made. Um, from Regina, what are the strategies in Maryland um, that you've enacted for diversification of the profession? Well, you know, we heard some concerns from some jurisdictions that uh, they had a large number of minorities who uh, applied but weren't hired. So we are asking for reports and accountability on, on the applicant pool, uh, the criteria they used to kind of concretize to see whether there is not some uh, bias, whether conscious or unconscious, um, we, we also are going to, we've developed relationships with the four uh, 
uh, historically black colleges and universities in the state to work on recruitment there. And, you know, we asked for actual uh, in the local master plans on implementing the blueprint uh, for their strategies uh, to do just that, to diversify the, the, uh, the, the number of people who enter the profession. And we think if we can actually work at the high school level, knowing there are these uh, scholarships and make a, a conscious effort and, and be very uh, clear in our effort to recruit uh, young black and brown people to the profession, we can start to increase our numbers. Um, and a second quick question for you to clarify from Stanford. Um, are teacher teaching fellow scholarship recipients required or encouraged to teach in under-resourced schools or districts in Maryland? Absolutely. Yes. You know, if these are high achieving students, um, we want to get them where they're most needed. And just as we had the extra incentive for the National Board cert cert Certification uh, uh, folks who uh, receive that, we want to get them to be in front of those students who need them the most. Great, thank you. I'm sure there'll be some more questions come through yep. for you soon, um, since there's so much in, in your all's blueprint. Um, but Dr. Wright, want to hear a little bit from you. Um, Mississippi had a, a Governor's Education Human Capital Task Force um, that was led by um, your yourself, your former office uh, department. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about that task force, who were the contributors and, and how did you all address these four elements? What were some of the solution ideas that came forward and um, what have been some of the challenges in getting different policymakers um, in Mississippi to you know dialogue about that action plan and, and begin to enact it? Sure, thank you. And let me just also say, I'm so very envious of Paul's uh, incredibly comprehensive way of approaching this. So uh, hats off to Marilyn for doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had a, a variety of people that served on the task force. We had the deans of education, we had superintendents, we had teachers, uh, some of our state board members, uh, university presidents were there, uh, state department staff. And I must say it was ably um, led and initiated by Megan. And we appreciated SREB's um, help with all that. Um, we did, I, I do feel that we are addressing, uh, there's a lot more to be done, but I think with the four elements that you've listed, one of the big things that we started is a teacher residency program, and we have used money from philanthropy and then money from the ESSER money that we received. Uh, so the teacher residency program allows um, teachers to enter uh, fully paid for. Uh, it's a two-year program, all tuition, all fees, uh, they get, and a, and a mentor is paid for at the same time. We've got five universities that we are working uh, with right now for that. We also initiated a performance-based licensure. I think that's something similar to what Paul was describing. Um, so that if teachers or uh, whether they're, they could be long-term substitutes, they could be instructional assistants, or they could be teachers in the classroom that might be struggling with passing some of the um, exams, uh, that we then are looking at student data and evaluation data. And if they can um, produce the results that we know that we need, then we can also then offer them a license that way. Uh, the Grow Your Own programs have always been something that people are interested in. We're really trying to encourage the districts that are most in need of, um, of teachers to, to really start those programs. What we're finding is that in many of the rural areas of, uh, of Mississippi, uh, a lot of those folks just grow up there and stay there. And so if that's the case, then we need to provide them a way uh, to become a teacher uh, in their own area. We've got the teacher academies, obviously, that we are um, in our high schools. And also we have just started uh, looking into the teacher apprenticeship program, which is similar to what Tennessee and Arkansas are doing. And so we're excited about that. Uh, the one thing um, we're, we're talking about pathways and licensure, um, we did in the task force uh, create several career and licensure pathways. Uh, that were developed. Some of those need funds, so that's something that is going to be a challenge, is continuing to fund that. The one thing we found also when COVID hit, uh, we waived uh, the required licensure tests um, during COVID because some of the tests were even being administered during that time. And we saw a 1,200% increase in the number of African-American candidates that we had um, applying for alternate programs. And we had an overall 400% increase uh, in the number of applicants that we had for traditional um, certification programs. So uh, that's something that we're uh, continuing to look at. 
We also started um, uh, this whole review and improvement process over our educator prep programs right when COVID began. And so that has been a long-term project um, that the department is working on uh, alongside the deans of our education uh, to talk about that. They're looking at new course pathways. Uh, how do we address science of reading in those courses? How do we also infuse high quality instructional materials uh, in those classrooms and in the tests that are being used and the texts that are being used? Uh, we also, as a department, um, really have leaned in very heavily with professional development. I firmly believe uh, in building capacity of both teachers and leaders. And it's not just the districts that are doing that, it's, it is the department that is doing that uh, on an ongoing basis. And I think this has been a key strategy for us for seeing uh, improvement in uh, student achievement. We also conducted um, educators of color conferences to try to not only recruit um, uh, a diverse uh, quality of candidates, but also to learn from them what might be, what are some of their challenges in even pursuing this as a profession, because we need to learn from that in order, um, in order to address that. Uh, we did, uh, I, as a result of this task force, and I've really got to do a hats off to SREB and its work for this, I think it really lifted up the whole compensation piece because for years, Mississippi has been, um, had been one of the lowest paid uh, uh, teachers in the nation. And so this impetus, I think the Senate even held a hearing on it, if, if memory serves. And um, that really lifted up the importance of raising teacher pay. So we were able to get the largest teacher pay raise passed um, in, in history, actually. And uh, it has now provided our teachers to be very competitive uh, with those in surrounding states. We also provide additional stipends for National Board Certified Teachers. We have a number, Mississippi has one of the largest numbers actually of National Board Certified Teachers in the nation. We also give stipends um, to those teachers that are willing to work in areas of our state where it's hard to recruit teachers. Um, I think some of the challenges are just that many of these recommendations uh, require funding. And um, obviously funding is always an issue um, that we have to deal with. And we're hoping to work collaboratively with our legislature. We have been over the years that I was there working very collaboratively with them uh, to address areas that we needed. And, but there's also a need for everybody to come together. And I think that's kind of what takes some time is getting everybody at the table, whether it is, um, agencies or districts or you know our, our legislators um, all working uh, at this at the same time because it takes that kind of cooperation and collaboration because it's got to be a priority for everybody. It can't just be a priority for the department. It's got to be a priority for the state. So I think I'm encouraged because I think we've done a lot, but I think there's a lot more that we can do and we can certainly learn from our colleagues um, in other states as well. Thank you, Dr. Wright. So as you can see, there's a lot of work happening um, in these two states as well as others on attempting to have some comprehensive change uh, to make teaching more attractive. There is a question um, for both you and um, Senator Pinsky from Marine. Was there pushback, is there pushback from teachers in the field related to the performance metrics in either of your states, um, Mississippi or Maryland? And if so, what were some strategies that you implemented to increase teacher buy-in? Well, actually, our performance base is voluntary. So it was it was a pilot that was started um, about two and a half years ago. And so teachers could volunteer for that. This was not something that was a requirement. And so I think um, that we used it as a, as a pilot to begin with, just to see what we wanted to make sure that that was sound. Um, so we know we've not received pushback, uh, quite honestly, from that because teachers volunteered to be as part of this pilot. And again, uh, in, in terms of uh, the focus on national board as an incentive with the increased state money, um, th there has been some pushback. There are some people who are, will choose not to pr pursue national board certification or maybe went through it and maybe had a bad experience. Um, and they've been concerned, why don't they get the same amount of money? And um, we try to explain that, that we... We think uh, as, as a performance-based assessment, it really reflects uh, people's willingness to reflect and change their practice, which we think is fundamental to improving instruction. Um, 
And it's also a floor, it's not a ceiling. So in other words, any of our local jurisdictions can negotiate additional funds if they want to spend them on people who are, t- who are choosing a different direction. Now, we are not uh, uh, prohibiting a master's degree or any of those kind of things, but we slowly want to start thinking about changing what a salary scale looks like. Um, and we want uh, any kind of uh, advanced degrees to be uh, ones that are significant in someone's progression in understanding uh, pedagogy and uh, in instruction. So there's been some, not major, um, and that's something we're just going to have to address. Megan, I think one thing we've found is that the biggest pushback comes for the idea of, look at the end of the year, what was your value added or your student test score growth? You get a bonus based on that for your classroom. It's a really different conversation when you're talking about a teacher taking on an advanced role where they're going to take more responsibility for leading a team or for mentoring other teachers and building their skill. Much more acceptability of that in the, in the teaching uh, force that we see and much more accepting of, well, to, to, achieve, to take on that kind of role, it makes sense that you needed to have shown prior success with your students because you're gonna be leading a team towards student results. So that's a different conversation about performance uh, when it really counts for teacher development. And as far as the the cost of these uh, increased pay for taking on an advanced role, this can can be significant for sure. And I I would be a first to advocate states putting more money into teacher compensation in general and putting more into into higher pay for teachers and taking advanced roles. I would also say though that districts and schools can do a lot to reallocate funding towards that purpose if they decide to do it. And we've seen that across the country in the opportunity culture schools. And we see states providing support for districts and schools to make that transition and rethink their own resources in addition to whatever additional dollars states can put in. So I'd really urge state policymakers to think both what more can we do and how can we support districts and schools rethinking their resources to prioritize high quality teaching? All really excellent points. Um, I wanna show some examples of some things that are happening in some other states too, or of course we're all concentrated on working on these issues. Um, so I just wanna, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but just to um, highlight some of the promising um, strategies and practices that are happening across across our region. Um, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Arkansas have recently been uh, three states in our region who've gotten federally approved registered teacher apprenticeship um, and are working toward implementing that new pathway um, in their states. Of course, uh, Dr. Wright mentioned their teacher residency pilot in Mississippi, and there's also one in Texas that I know uh, Dr. Hassel Public Impact has been involved with in making sure that it is set up um, and studied really well. Those are uh, that is a paid teacher residency pilot um, with many districts and, and universities in Texas. Another one is um, West Virginia has been working on combining Grow Your Own with accelerated learning pathways. So helping to get students started um, in dual enrollment and other sort of accelerated learning options for um, um, a teaching teaching courses and and moving into. Um, at teaching degrees in college. And then um, SRV also did a, a teacher preparation commission report. We have many suggestions on improving teacher preparation and there are a lot of states working on that aspect um, uh, across our region. In licensure and supports, which again, we you know emphasize that these are important to tie together. There's lots of things happening. Of course, Maryland is uh, leading the way in many of these pieces. Um, but there's also work in Arkansas and North Carolina on shifting teaching roles and responsibilities, as Dr. Hassel pointed out at the start of that conversation. Um, and there are some states who are really working toward tiered licensure policies, um, making sure that there are more pathways and those pathways advance through the profession. Arkansas, Georgia, of course, Maryland and Oklahoma are, are working on that. And then Mississippi, um, with their plan, did did suggest that to state leaders um, to move toward that direction. And North Carolina is a very successful advanced teacher roles pilot um, for the last several years um, that has provided a lot of really good uh, studying and information on advanced teacher roles. And I know they worked quite closely with Opportunity Culture in many districts for that pilot across the state. On pet professional supports, um, there are, of course, you know, induction programs and uh, 
been um, some spotlights on that in North Carolina. Now, Maryland, of course, is working to um, set up a, a top quality induction program there. Louisiana has for several years been working on um, and supporting districts with a statewide mentorship program and training um, to ensure that there are mentor teachers in all schools across Louisiana. Um, Arkansas and Oklahoma have uh, several rigorous professional development efforts that include coaches for success and really highlight individual needs of teachers um, and moving those through uh, long-term programs that include um, not just classic PD, but uh, success coaching as well and other innovative strategies. Uh, North Carolina has proposed a professional advancement count, which would actually tie dollars to professional development and help make sure that teachers don't have to pay out of pocket for all of their uh, support needs. And then of course, Maryland's blueprint, they have, uh, are working towards those revised schedules and planning time as Senator Pinsky mentioned. And then again, as Senator Pinsky mentioned with compensation, Maryland's leading the way on, on gains and compensation overall, as well as tying that to um, you know, growth and uh, advanced roles. The opportunity culture model, Dr. Hassel can, can uh, certainly um, provide you know, a link to, to that model and more detail on um, those salary structure changes. There's a teacher incentive allotment fund in Texas that uh, works to retain effective teachers in rural and high needs areas with significant bonuses for um, effective teachers that are um, interested in, in teaching in those uh, places. And then there's a, a new act in Alabama to recruit and retain STEM teachers. And again, not an exhaustive list, but just some things to highlight that are going on across the region um, on those, those four pieces. Uh, another spotlight too on one of our states in South Carolina, um, as many states are using ESSER funds to try and um, address different learning disruptions and uh, other sorts of issues. And many states are using those dollars to help fund the teacher workforce. Um, South Carolina is one that we um, spotlight in, in using those funds in a collaborative, innovative ways to really develop pipelines of talent. I want to turn to continuing, of course, to talk about the actual strategies, but also the process, because if states are going to move in the direction of comprehensive change, they're going to uh, uh, try to um, address those four different puzzle pieces and the dozens of things and strategies that kind of live within each of those four. Uh, there, there's a lot of steps to take. and It's very hard um, to do big change like this. So I um, want to address that process piece in the conversation as well with, with our panelists today. In our blueprint report, we suggest that it's really important for states when they're working toward this comprehensive change to make teaching more attractive that they do four key things. None of them are easy, of course. Um, one is making sure that you really understand your own state, uh, district, and community needs. Dive into your data, collect more data, analyze that data, um, you know, making sure that you really understand what are the issues at play in your own state before you try and come up with solution plans for those problems. Define the problem really clearly. Another important step, this, these issues, of course, uh, uh, you know, fall within the realm of many, many stakeholders in education as well as policymakers and their interest levels, of course, with, um, with business and, and other folks, as since teachers are, you know, an economic strong point. So make sure that there's collaboration in, when, you're, when you're creating your own blueprint. Step three, put it into action and realize and commit to long-term change, which of course, Senator Pinsky mentioned, they have a you know, uh, 10 plus year rollout plan and then make a continuous and significant investment, um, which again, Senator Pinsky pointed out that they're attempting to do. Some spotlights really quick here before I ask some more questions of our panelists. Um, Kentucky has fantastic data system. We featured a little bit of their information and some guests on our last webinar. Um, where they are really trying to uh, do more in the collection and analysis of um, their teacher workforce. Um, and many of our states, you know, they, they, have, they have some steps to go on, on collecting data. Um, this information is from NCTQ uh, examining um, those, those best data practices and which ones in our states 
which ones of our states are really um, able to do that. To highlight Alabama and Mississippi, of course, with Dr. Wright and the, the task force that she mentioned, collaboration is key in those two states. Um, have really uh, tried to have some of those really good collaborative conversations, talking with educators directly, um, uh, which is really, really important. You can't put a blueprint together without listening and talking to teachers themselves in your state. Arkansas has adopted a teacher career continuum, so they are looking at slowly rolling out um, uh, different strategies, practices, and services for teachers across an entire continuum step by step really intentionally and deliberately. And North Carolina is another state that's working toward a comprehensive blueprint, um, and it's making slow steps to um, uh, making sure all stakeholders are involved in that conversation and making sure that it is designed well for the state. And then, of course, Maryland um, and all of their work there. So want to ask some more questions of our panelists, and I know that uh, Senator Pinsky unfortunately needs to leave us um, uh, soon for uh, another commitment um, that will uh, unfortunately take him away from, from our time here with us, but we really appreciate you joining Senator Pinsky for as long as you could. But um, a question for, for you before you have to, to hop off, can you give us a glimpse into the process um, from Maryland and how you all came up with your blueprint, um, how you, you know, worked through all of the challenges with all of the state leaders and different stakeholders who were a part of that, and then now working through the challenges of, of enacting it um, and committing to such an enormous long-term financial investment. Sure, Megan. And, and just as you mentioned that it's a 10 to 11 year phase in, and as major as it seems, and I went through a lot of uh, items in it, uh, it took a long time to set the table. It didn't happen overnight. And, and I think people understand while we have an urgency, we also have to show some patience. Uh, a number of years ago, the legislature called for a commission of 25 members uh, to do two things, to redo our state funding formula, but to secondly, to see how we could transform our schools to be a world-class school system. Now, this commission uh, made up of legislators, academics, state and local school board members, representatives, local government officials, state superintendent, private sector, teachers, their organization, early childhood experts. We actually met for, met for three years. And luckily we were led by uh, Britt Kerwin. That's why it was frequently called the Kerwin Commission, who was a former chancellor of the University of Maryland uh, uh, system. Um, look, we had certain assumptions that states and counties would increase their investment in education. There would be explicit accountability. Uh, and we wanted data. We want to be data driven. So we contracted with the National Center for Education and the Economy, NCEE, and they've benchmarked successful school systems and nations around the world. And we use that as a starting point. What were the uh, common criteria? in those uh, nations and even in the United States, those states that have proven success. And proven success was based on objective criteria, not subjective. We also built in time to hear from the public and interest groups. And then we decided after getting all that data and information, how could we take that information and apply it to Maryland? So we could try to build a world-class school system based on that benchmarking and the practices we studied. And we had to apply it to our concrete conditions, just as I encourage those states to do it to their concrete conditions. Our economies are different. A lot of our contributing factors are different. But you have to take the best practices and how would that work in your state? At the end of those three years, it was almost virtually unanimous on the recommendations. At that point, we turned it into legislation and I went through the legislative process and my 187 colleagues, of course, had uh, ideas for fine tuning and making changes. And um, I, I, it went through my committee on the Senate side and we had to negotiate with the House. Um, but a couple of important points, and then, I, then I'll, I'll step aside. Uh, we want independent accountability and implementation. Um, so we created an actual independent board. It's called the AIB board. 
A for accountability and I for implementation. And they actually will have the authority to withhold money if policies are ignored. At the same time, we allow flexibility in the specific implementation of the uh, uh, proposals, but yet we demand fidelity to the policy. So because of the delay with COVID and the veto, uh, the state uh, has just released its uh, state um, plan, um, uh, recommended plan. And when that's adopted in the next couple of months, then all of the 24 local school systems are gonna to have to put an implementation plan together that will be reviewed and hopefully accepted by the oversight board. Um, so accountability is very important. Now look, this does cost, and we committed the state and we told the uh, local counties in our, in our state, the counties are the school systems, uh, they were gonna to have to ante up. Now we didn't have unlimited blank checks, but over those 10 or 11 years, it's a lot of money, I'll be frank with you. And it's close to $3.9 billion, um, uh, overwhelming majority from the state, but uh, a buy-in from the locals. That might not be the number you use in your jurisdictions, but coming up with what practices you want to implement, a plan to do it, and funding in place can assure it'll be successful. And, you know, we want to stay the course. You know, a lot of teachers or local school systems say, this is just a fad, it'll go away. We don't want this to go away. We think it's proven by uh, experience around the world and uh, around the United States. And we think if we give it a chance to get implemented and we do it with fidelity and the funding stays in place that we are gonna transform our schools here in Maryland. And I wanna thank SRED for this invitation and the great work they're doing in, in doing the very same thing of taking good concepts and helping states apply them to the concrete conditions. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Paul. Do you have just a moment for a quick question? <clears throat> one question I think I can handle. Okay, one question from Sarah. Um, how is teaching teacher effectiveness measured um, in Maryland, and, and how do you tie that with increased pay for uh, you know highly effective teachers? We have steered clear of tying uh, evaluations and success to explicit testing, uh, a clear nexus. We think a lot of studies around the country have shown that's not the best way to uh, go. We, we are looking at systems, uh, school systems, and we wanna see their results and we wanna see it uh, disaggregated as well by uh, students in poverty or by race or students uh, where English is a second language or special education. So we're holding the school systems accountable. We're not holding individual teachers accountable based on their test scores. Look, I, I, I uh, grew up working in another county that had a very strong evaluation system. Uh, they put it a peer assistance and review program. Um, and, and we think with uh, administrators and teacher leaders trained in having those uh, courageous conversations and holding teachers accountable and getting them to change their practices to be more successful, to be more reflective, which we think is, is reflected, hate the overuse of term, in national board approach, in the ed TPA approach. Uh, we think if people have the capacity to look at what works and what doesn't work and change their behaviors and their practices, we think we'll get results, uh, particularly if you take these 30 or 40 recommendations that we include in the blueprint uh, for Maryland's future. So uh, just to clarify then, um, teachers, uh, to get bonuses is really tied to, to national board certification or are there other measures um, to work up increased pay across your career ladder? We, we include, um, you know, having uh, salary scales, you know, and so we think experience does matter. Um, but some of those can be adjusted. We set a floor of certain criteria that must be included. Beyond that, the local school systems can add to it. Um, so you we do not have something, for example, that says if, if 18 kids or 40% or reach uh, advanced, that you will get a bonus. We, we think that's counterproductive. We think most studies over the last 25 years have shown that didn't work. Well, thanks for um, the insights and all of the work that Marilyn is doing, Senator Pinsky. Um, uh, 
potentially there will be some folks contacting you all to learn more about all of the, the work that you're doing as they make some plans in their own states. But really, Great. really appreciate your time. And we'll Thank continue you. the conversation with Dr. Wright and Dr. Hassel. Um, would love to um, just pause for a second and, and see if you all have um, um, any thoughts on the question about teacher quality and measuring that and uh, rewarding teacher quality. Well, I can, I'll speak for Mississippi. We don't tie um, teacher pay raise, whatever, to evaluation either. Um, you know, I think that we've really shifted to looking um, at teachers, getting them to self-reflect on their practices. Um, I think our evaluation system is one that really hits all of the key um, issues around good teachers. And I think part of what we've been trying to do is rather than, you know, use a, I don't know, a score on a scale, if you will, to give them feedback in the areas that we feel that they need feedback, give them time to self-reflect, offer the professional development and the support that's needed. Uh, we have a lot of coaches in Mississippi, and that's been a huge strategy for us. We've got literacy coaches, math coaches, special education coaches, school improvement coaches, um, data analyses coaches, uh, digital learning coaches. And the reason we leaned in so heavily around the coaching is to make sure that we're building the capacity of teachers. It's not um, it's not a punitive thing to have a coach. <laughs> it's a good thing to have a coach because what we're really trying to do is get them to reflect on their own practices, um, you know, where that is concerned. And so I think that um, this has got to be, teachers have got to feel that they're supported in this process and that it's not going to be a gotcha system because the moment you build that in, you lose the confidence of your teachers and you lose the ability to really, uh, I think, move forward. So that that's kind of where Mississippi is very similar in that uh, to where Maryland is. I would certainly echo the, the comments about the importance of guidance and support being the forefront for what teachers are given. and, and Dr. Wright mentioned the coaching systems in Mississippi and opportunity culture. We have these team leaders called multi-classroom leaders that have a team of three-day teachers. They co-teach with them, model, observe, give feedback, meet with them many hours a week as a team and individually to give them that kind of guidance and support. And that's really the name of the game when it comes to teachers. Now, we do, we do encourage districts and schools when they're selecting those teachers to be multi-classroom leaders to consider their prior effectiveness with students as part of the selection process, along with their leadership competencies. Because our, our research has shown that these MCLs are very effective with their teams at lifting growth, about an extra half year of learning every year when teachers join these teams. And when you look at the MCLs that are getting that result, they are coming from the top ranks of teachers when it comes to their prior success with students. So that's part of the selection criteria for these multi-classroom leaders because of the big responsibility they're taking on to lead other teachers toward success in the way that Dr. Wright was describing. A follow-up to that um, that I will attempt to answer. Sarah asks um, um, that uh, the point about Texas and their teacher incentive allotment fund um, and giving bonuses to highly effective teachers. Uh, she asks, can anyone speak to that? Um, I, I can give some overview um, and there's more information available on the TEA website, the Texas Education Agency, um, but their uh, incentive allotment fund um, requires that districts who wanna participate in that, they come up with very specific plans on um, how to, um, um, give uh, recognized designations to teachers in order for them to qualify for that incentive fund. Um, and on the highly effective side of, the, of, of that aspect, because there is, you know, you get a bonus for teaching in rural or high need schools, but um, you must also be highly effective. Um, one designation route for that is uh, national board certification. And those teachers who have completed um, that entire process. And then a second, um, designation pathway is that uh, effective teachers, um, when they are approved from a local teacher designation system, and that approval process um, must be multi-step and include the submission of an um, application 
to the um, Texas Education Agency and built around um, their effectiveness uh, systems within the district. So that does tie more toward um, um, effectiveness measures um, that the that Texas has approved and then the districts have built on um, in more depth. So um, again, the TEA website has some videos and some different things that, that you might be able to get a little bit more detail on how um, they institute those, but a bit of flexibility for districts there. Um, well, I'll continue on. Dr. Wright, I wanted to um, turn to you next and talk a little bit about the power of long-term commitment um, in order to make change. And of course, you have been interviewed, uh, can't even count how many times now, on uh, long-term commitment tied to Mississippi's gains in literacy. Um, but if you could kind of, uh, you know, raise up for the group, how can um, states like Mississippi uh, make some commitment to the positive change, to comprehensive change, of course, um, and, uh, you know, really um, work toward, you know, significant commitment of all stakeholders um, and significant revenue, you know, as everything takes money. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so true. And I think that um, the one thing that, you know, I think that we've we've done is, you know, we've developed a really strong plan. We selected um, evidence-based and research-based strategies uh, where that was concerned, and we didn't veer from it. I mean, I think that's the, the key piece. So if you're looking at something um, like what we're talking about today, this has got to be a priority for everybody um, because it's not something that the State Department can do alone. It's not something that the district can do alone. Uh, it's got to be, um, you know, something that everybody comes together and really sees this as a workforce um, priority in the state. Mississippi has, has been blessed the past couple of years. We are, we've been running a surplus over the past couple of years, and I think our surplus currently is north of $2 billion. So this is a good time when you're, you've are you got an opportunity like this to, to really think how how can we uh, come together to complete these pathways that we developed through the task force to uh, reward, as um, Dr. Hussle has been saying, these teacher leaders that don't want to leave the classroom, but want to be leading. And I think that the, I heard that again and again from teachers in the state. I don't want to leave the classroom. I don't want to become an administrator, but I'd love to do something more to um, develop my own professional skills or, or offer what skills that I have. Um, to other teachers, whether it's in a mentor teacher or coach or something of that nature. But I think that um, the State Department has to keep the light shining on this. I mean, I think that's something that it's easy to get lost if somebody's not talking about it. And so somebody's got to be talking about it all the time and then sharing data. And one thing I forgot to say, we now have funding because uh, I saw that sign up, the, the little map up there that had a big fat zero for Mississippi in terms of data collection. And I thought, yeah, that's true for the past few years. Um, but now we have, um, I think it's going to be launched in January. Uh, we've had the money uh, to launch a brand new data collection system. And I think that is another way for us to really keep the spotlight on what is happening. Um, because I think that the more that you talk about this, the more that you lift this up, uh, and the more that we're coming together to talk about this collaboratively. This isn't, you know, this isn't to be used as a stick. It's really to be used as how do we ensure that the little ones who we have responsibility for now and in the future have the very best teachers they can possibly have? Because there's so much research out there about the importance of having a, an, an amazing teacher and even more important research about having an amazing teacher two years in a row. So when you've got a state like Mississippi that has the level of poverty that it does, then it becomes even more critical that those, those teachers that are standing in front of those classrooms um, are the best that they can be. And I think having a data system and being able to report back to our legislature, I was sorry I didn't say this when Paul was on the phone uh, on the call, because one of the things that we have done is we've developed a whole strategy to report back to the legislature about return on investment because they give the State Department money for these various initiatives. But I think it's important that they know what their return on investment was. So when we go across the street, as we say, to talk about our next year's budget, the one thing that I've always tried to keep them informed of is you gave us this money for this, here's your return on investment. Because if they can see that they're getting the results based on the money 
that they're appropriating for this, then they're far more inclined to want to appropriate more money. Um, I think in the long haul, too, something that we have not talked about in terms of teachers and teacher shortages and the use of outstanding teachers um, is the use of technology. I mean, I think we we don't talk about that enough. We just went through um, a huge initi initiative in Mississippi where we not only made sure that every teacher and student had a brand new device, but now we've moved into phase two, which to me is the most important part, which is the digital learning part. Now, how do we get teachers to use these devices um, you know, in a way that is instructionally sound, because you've got some districts in our state who can't find, I'll pick this one, uh, an advanced chemistry teacher, let's just say. I can't find an advanced chemistry teacher. Well, that, then that lets all the students at that high school, you know, really kind of struggle. So how about we pick a teacher that isn't a highly qualified, outstanding advanced chemistry teacher in another school and virtually bring them into that classroom where that teacher, do, where they don't have a teacher. And then that district that doesn't have a teacher who was given money for a teacher, but can't find it, could then give part of that stipend back to that teacher who's taking the responsibility of that AP chemistry class. So we just need to think out of the box in order to make sure, particularly in areas that we struggle to get really um, teachers of special education teachers, math teachers, science teachers, those teachers that we know um, are needed in all areas of our state. Uh, we may not have the physical body that walks into that classroom, but where there's got to be a way that we provide them that outstanding education, even if they don't have that teacher standing right in front of them. And in another part of that money for the district that couldn't find that teacher, we could also then hire an instructional assistant to be in that classroom and pay money for that. So you're still using money, but not as much, but you're still rewarding the teacher who's taken on the responsibility of this outstanding work that they're doing. And you're giving an instructional assistant an opportunity to be working in a classroom which then could lead to one of those grow your own programs as well. So there's a lot of ways that we could connect this. We just really need to be collaborative about it and we need to stick to it. That's the bottom line. We need to stick to it. Dr. Hassel, any, anything to add um, from you on, especially the, the revenue side of things? So I know that's something that, that you all um, have provided, you know, a lot of strategies on for districts and states. Um, how to get revenue committed for, you know, or, or restructured for um, supporting teachers. So that's such an important uh, component in this. And I, I guess first I just want to, I hope everyone was really listening to Dr. Wright and, and Senator Pinsky on their leadership story, which were both so impressive. And one thing I wanted to elevate there is just the, the combined focus on both data, evidence, research, best practice, what do we know from other systems, from, from other studies will work effectively with kids, and high level of engagement, gathering input, understanding what stakeholders think and are concerned about. And then putting those together, as Senator Pinsky said, by adapting that set of best practices to our context. I feel like that is the essence of leadership in this area. They both really have been exemplary in this area, because you can swing the either way, you can be all about input and stakeholder engagement and end up with something that's not going to make the result for the kids or the educators. You can swing into expert mode and research and top down implementation without taking into account context and understanding. And so I think I really applaud them both for for that bringing those together. That seems like the essence of leadership here that's, that's needed. And the revenue piece, Megan, is so important because, as, as the other speakers have mentioned, these, these things cost money to do. And as I said earlier, it could be a combination of new money. When we have additional resources, the surplus Dr. Wright mentioned, other, other kind of long-term increases. Can we put those towards what matters most, which is high-quality teaching? And what does that look like? So that's one part of it. The other part of it is, how can we repurpose the dollars we have uh, for, for this exact purpose? And, and this, the role, and I think I mentioned this before, but just to click down on a little bit, the role the state can play on that front is really supporting school systems and schools in the process of rethinking and reallocating their resources for these purposes. That's not an insignificant task. Districts and states, as districts and schools need to put time into that. They need to put the staff into that. They may need technical assistance in North Carolina and Arkansas. Megan, you showed on the slide, the states have said, hey, every year we're going to select a group of districts that want to make this kind of restructuring a priority 
put more funding into teacher pay, put more funding into teacher uh, leadership positions, reorganize schools along those lines. Every year, we're going to run a process of selecting districts for that, providing you with the support, whether it's TA or funding, to make those changes. And, and that has a dual purpose of, you know, A, providing the resources for the rethinking and the change management, but also it's a focusing point. It's the state saying every year we invite districts and schools to step back and think, how can we make the teaching profession more attractive in your place? How can we make it retain teachers much more effectively? How can we give teachers much more guidance and support and pay? And what's the local version of that? Again, back to my earlier point and, and Dr. Wright and Senator Pinsky's point, guided by best practice, guided by research and data about what we know works. That's a great role for the state to play in addition to just trying to put more resources into these critical issues. A few more questions have come through um, from our audience um, on various topics you all have touched. So we'll bounce around a little here. Um, Dr. Wright, is the apprenticeship piece that you mentioned um, in an ideation stage for Mississippi and how likely is it that Mississippi will actually have one? Well, I think there's the hope that we will. Uh, you know, I think that, that this is just the beginning. And so um, I would encourage um, whoever's asking that question to reach out uh, to the State Department because the, in the licensure area and um, find out a little bit more about that, that we're just beginning to look at that because that is going to require some funding. So um, it's not fully baked. If that's, the, if that's the question I'm being asked, it's not fully baked. I believe so. I think it was clarification of sort of where in the process. Um, the beginning. Sure. Um, another question on a different topic um, from Robert. One of the challenges we are seeing in our work with districts, uh, and many states are doing a great job of increasing alternative certification, non-traditional certification, and visa teachers from overseas. Mm -hmm. However, we are seeing very little done to support these teachers' growth in developing their necessary skills. So any comments about what is being done and supported um, by states to provide support and mentorship um, from one of our key elements that we've talked about? So either one of you jump in there. Well, we don't have an official mentor program. I mean, that's something that, so I can't, I can't speak to that. And um, Mississippi currently um, does not accept visas from out of country. So, um, I, I, I couldn't speak to that, but maybe Dr. Hassel could speak to that. The, the research on support for teachers and what's effective is really clear. There was just a recent uh, report put out on this by the, uh, the, the by Harvard and Brown and, and some uh, organizations that are involved in professional learning. And it, what really comes out of that report so strongly is that, that it's on the job daily support and guidance that teachers need to be effective, that it's focused on their instructional practice, tied to the curriculum that they're teaching and deeply steeped in that content. And then it's that repeated daily uh, practice, observation, feedback cycles that, that lead to improvement. And so I'm, I'm saying that's at the school level. So I'm, I'm not talking about states when I say that, but I think thinking about state role, thinking about district role, uh, how can you create that kind of development going on in your schools all the time? And I think you know, I think it's natural to think of states thinking, hey, well, let's 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 allocate money to hire a bunch of special mentors who are going to go into schools and and support new teachers. Uh, but that moves away from this idea of every day a teacher going to work and having the guidance and support they need. If that mentor is supporting 20, 20 new teachers or uh, across schools, it's, it's going to be spread thin, and they're not they're not part of the the direct line of responsibility the way a teacher leader working in your school would be. If you think of a third grade team working together, a teacher leader on that team helping all the teachers responsible for all the students uh, in the third grade, knowing all the students in the third grade. That's the kind of support environment that we know really works well. Uh, and so, how can you help schools and districts have that? every day for their teachers and teachers have that every day. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic point, Dr. Hassel. And our, our review of the research um, on this issue shows, uh, uh, you know, 
very strongly that mentorship is um, a key piece, if not the key piece, in order to help with growth of our teachers for you know in their instructional practices, pedagogy, content, um, every everything surrounding it, and that um, you know the research is showing, like you said, that that mentors who are um, tied directly, you know, to those students teaching, they have some familiarity with with those students, they are colleagues of each other, that that uh, type of mentor is much more successful in instructional growth um, and teaching capacity and, and supporting you know, great teachers, no matter the pathway, whether they come from alternative certification um, routes or any other sort of route, that's pretty standard across the board. Um, but there are um, you know, several um, states who are working toward more uh, strategic and broad um, efforts to have mentorship for teachers. There are, are certainly places where they're working on that uh, more diligently in the first three years of teaching, no matter the pathway um, with induction programs. And SRAB actually has several um, great induction programs um, that we work with in, in several states in our region to support teachers coming from alternative certification. Um, from CTE and then and from other places going into STEM as well as um, English and, and social studies core curriculums. Um, so, you know, this is a really important point. I think that we would all agree, you know, to emphasize um, that mentorship aspect and, and building that for every teacher, no matter the pathway is, is key. Um, I don't see any other questions from the audience, so I'll I'll ask a final question um, of both of you all to really sort of um, hopefully kind of capture um, some wisdom from each of you, if you will, that you can potentially pass on to other folks, no matter their role, no matter their state um, that they're working on with these issues. But would just love to have a piece of advice that you would give on. Um, how to get started, or if you know folks are in the middle of these conversations, how to really make sure that you're having collaborative conversations, that you have everybody at the table, that you really need to work with on this from you know K-12 to higher ed to state leaders, policymakers, business folks, even. Um, and and how do you uh, you know navigate those complicated conversations with uh, the you know amount of of issues that we're dealing with here in the entire career continuum for teachers and and these four kind of key elements so to speak um, for a, a blueprint of change. Either one of you jump in first. I won't I won't uh, call you out there. It's, it's a high bar when you say we have to dispense wisdom. Right? We're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you 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 start, Dr. Hassel. <laughs> yeah, I think that these are complicated conversations, and I, I think it's uh, I guess what I would encourage is a is a blend of of thinking big and thinking beyond our current structures, and at the same time understanding how this can be adapted to your state context, but also within your state to the local context that you're you're. Uh, you're working because that's a that combination of vision. Well, let's really go for something that's going to give every student excellent teaching every year and every educator a, a career where they are supported and guided and have the opportunity to advance in their career and earn more without leaving teaching while continuing to teach. If we have that vision of big in mind, uh, then we can start to think about how does that work in this state? How does that work in this district and adapt the, the vision there? But start with that big vision and the big vision needs to include getting outside of our current constraints and, and thoughts about how schools are organized and how the teaching profession is organized. I think too often in these discussions, we take that as a given. It's like we have these teaching slots. How can we fill them more effectively? How can we hang on to the people that are in them better by trying harder? And we, we need to do all of those things, of course. But if we also step back and think, how could this whole system be different? How could we have a different set of roles, a different set of organizational structures in schools that are much more rewarding for teachers, that are much more dynamic, that are much more collaborative, that are much more supportive of their daily life? If we rethink that first and then say, how can we attract teachers into that? How can we keep teachers in that? I think we're in a much better position to be successful uh, across the board. 
Yeah, I, I totally concur. I, you know, for me, it's always been, you know, um, gather the willing because where there's a will, there's a way. And the other thing that I will say is listen to what teachers have to say, because um, I had a teacher advisory of almost 400 teachers and they were amazing. And, you know, you'd say, what is it that you need? They're more than willing to tell you what it is that they need, but more importantly then is what do you do with it? <laughs> you know, that if they're telling you that they need support, then get them to find that. But then you need to be able to have enough people sitting at the table. And I think to Dr. House's part, make sure that you have everybody at the table that needs to be at the table for these kinds of conversations. Um, and But most importantly is the teacher voice and talk to the teachers that are in the trenches right now um, and find out what kind of supports do they need? What do they wish they had more of? Um, and I think then making sure that you've got the legislators at the table as well. I mean, Senator Pinsky is an ed chair. That's the one key thing. I think having both of your ed chairs involved in this conversation as we did with SREB, when we had the task force we had, and that really was the prompting of the Senate ed chair to have the whole conversation around uh, teacher pay. And so if people, if you lift up the issues and you make sure that you do it in a way that is not finger pointing, that is aspirational, that to um, Dr. Hassel's uh, point about um, futuristic, what do we want for all and keep children at the center? It's got to be teacher's voice, but it's got to be student focused because that's the bottom line of why we're here. We're here to ensure that the children that are placed in our care each and every day are learning and growing as much as they possibly can be. So it's it's those key pieces that I think you come together and say, what do we want the future of our state or our district or our school to be? And um, how then do we go about doing that in such a way that everybody feels that it's um, that owns it and um, and then works toward it? Wonderfully said by both of you, um, especially the point of listening, uh, Dr. Wright. You know, as I've had the pleasure of interviewing thousands of teachers and principals across the region the last several years, and it is um, the absolute best place to get innovative ideas, to get feedback, to really understand um, the issues of today. Uh, you know, as many educators un uh, know that the issues of today are so much different than they were just, just two or three years ago. Dr. Hassel, any, looks like you might want to have one last word there. I'm not sure if I'm, oh, <laughs> no. I don't, th thank you for having us as part of this. And having, thank you for having this conversation and leading the conversations in so many states. It's such a, such a value to, to you know, ask policymakers and everyone else to come together and discuss these issues. And you're, you're really leading that, Megan, in so many places. Much appreciated. Yeah, I would Much appreciated for, for you both to attend as well, Senator Pinsky. Really appreciate your all's time um, and, and the conversation today. Hopefully it was helpful to folks and giving some things to look, look to um, and some actions and strategies that states are trying out across the region. Uh, we have much more on our website um, of, of some, some different reports, the data, of course, that we featured a few weeks ago in our previous webinar, this blueprint report, um, and other ways that SREB is working to, to convene, to publish, and to support action in states. So please visit our website for more, um, and feel free to contact any of us um, with, with questions. We are all always happy to um, talk with folks about these pieces and share ideas, share conversations and uh, little, little tidbits of wisdom um, as the panelists have today with all of you. So a huge thank you to everyone, a huge thank you to the audience for participating with us. Um, and we hope all of you all have a really fabulous rest of the school year this year and a great Thanksgiving next.